Hello, good morning and good afternoon to our colleagues and partners from Asia, Europe, Oceania, and, uh, and thanks for taking your time to attend this important uh, webinar. My name is uh, Aurélien Piron. I am the technical manager for Ruminant uh, Fidelity in uh, L'Allemand Animal Nutrition. And I am very delighted to host uh, this live uh, webinar with all of you uh, today. So we are uh, quite a big number of people. We will wait a, a little bit to the last uh, attendees to, to join to make sure that we are all here. I think we can start. So today I am uh, hosting uh, two great uh, experts, uh, Dr. Frédéric Chaucheras Durand, who holds a PhD in uh, microbiology uh, and is aid within L'Allemand Animal Nutrition of the Ruminant Research uh, Center with a high expertise on uh, rumen uh, macro microbiota. She's based on, uh, at uh, INRAE, uh, France. Then, Dr. Emiliano Raffrenato holds a PhD in animal science uh, from Cornell University and is currently working as a consultant for uh, Rumen, editing uh, NDS professional CNCPS based platform, and uh, is also assistant professor at University of uh, Padova. He is based in uh, Italy. Thank you so much for being uh, with us today and accepting this uh, challenge to speak about that within, uh, uh, let's say, one hour. It is always great to have you, uh, to having you uh, with us. So this session is the first one of a series of two episodes where we will discuss about the importance of fiber digestion and the rumen environment, from the rumen microbes to diet formulation. So welcome. It is the first session of webinars. Before starting, please be informed that this session will take around 15 minutes plus a 15 minute session of uh, question and answer. We invite you to place questions or comments in the small square you have in your control box menu, usually on the down right area. After the presentation, I will be placing those questions to the relevant uh, speakers. So it's time, uh, it's time to start. Um, Frederick, uh, I will uh, give you the, uh, the control, to the mic, to be able to, uh, to present us how the microbes are important and involved in this fair degradation. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you, Aurélien, for this uh, kind introduction. And uh, as Aurélien just mentioned, I'm a Roman microbiologist and I am uh, working basically on uh, Roman microbiota. So I will talk uh, this morning about Roman microbiota and uh, I will show you how uh, this Roman microbiota is crucial to ensure uh, good fiber digestibility uh, in ruminants. And first of all, of course, uh, it's obvious that fiber is and remains a major component in all ruminant uh, diets worldwide, of course. And the main digestive part is constituted by plant cell wall polysaccharides with a diversity of polymers like pectins, hemicelluloses, and cellulose, which are more or less accessible for degradation. Thanks to the unique ability of uh, ruminants to convert all this plant biomass into energy and finally uh, valuable and edible products, these animals are not in competition with humans for their nutrition and they participate as well to land architecture, making them uh, essential in sustainable agricultural systems. Fiber degradation cannot be ensured by any host enzyme. So ruminants have developed a very strong symbiotic relationship with a complex and specialized microbial community called microbiota, inhabiting the rumen, which is the main compartment uh, in which uh, fiber degradation occurs. 
the three main groups uh, of rumen macrobiota are bacteria, ciliate protozoa, and fungi, and we also find archaea and viruses as well. These microbial communities differ in abundance and size, but most of them are considered as strictly anaerobic uh, microorganisms, as they cannot live without, uh, in the presence of oxygen. The more specialized fibrolytic microbiota belongs to these three microbial groups. Uh, indeed, among the bacterial domain, their, their proportion is quite low, as you can see, with not more than 5% uh, really recognized as true fibrolytic, specialized in cellulose and hemicellulose degradation. Among the ciliate protozoa community, uh, fibrolytic microbes are mostly in the antodinomorphid uh, group, and regarding fungi, all isolated uh, fungi from the rumen are found uh, fibrolytic. These communities use different strategies to break down fiber in a very efficient way. And first of all, they need to be in close contact with plant cell walls. Bacteria, as you can see on this scheme, will adhere tightly to plant cell wall polysaccharides through more or less complex systems. For instance, Ruminococcus albus here uses a quite simple uh, complex, which uh, uh, involves cellulose binding domains or CBMs which are linked to cellulolytic enzymes. Ruminococcus flavifacians uses a much more uh, complex cellulosome system, gathering anchoring molecules, uh, which help bacterial attachment to fiber, and scaffolding proteins, which increase accessibility uh, of carbohydrate-active enzymes to their substrate. Finally, Fibrobacter succinogenes uses long pili, as you can see here, to sense polysaccharides, and produce uh, what we call outer membrane vesicles or microvesicules, which contain enzymes and on which are exposed fibroslime proteins, which strengthen adhesive properties of the bacteria onto fiber. You have here uh, electron microscopy pictures of the most important fibrolytic bacterial species. And you can see a very high density of bacteria adhering onto uh, plant cell walls here. You can also see the different uh, systems for adhesion, such as uh, microvesicules, here, for example, uh, here, cellulosomal systems, or glycocalyx. So the production of all these appendixes are very important to ensure a very strong, strong adhesion onto fiber. Regarding ciliate protozoa, these large cells are able to ingest entire uh, plant particles, as you can see on this picture and the plant polysaccharides are thus degraded into feed vacuoles containing carbohydrate active enzymes, which are also uh, able to be released uh, outside the cells. Finally, fungi will become embedded uh, on plant cell walls, as you can see here, thanks to the extension on, of uh, uh, filaments, which are called rhizoids, and to the production of fungal cellulosomes, which leads to a real inlay uh, uh, on, the, on the plant structures. After the fibrolytic microbiota has adhered to uh, fiber, the colonization process starts. And the plant ingested by the animal is initially recovered with what we call epiphytic microbiota, that are here, which are living in the plant on the plant surface. Uh, but you see that very quickly after ingestion, uh, this microbiota is totally displaced by ruminal primary colonizers, which start to utilize accessible carbohydrates. This is why they are called generalists for the first hours after ingestion. Then, cellulose and hemicellulose molecules are made accessible for secondary colonizers, which are the true cellulolytic or hemicellulolytic species, and this occurs generally uh, later in time. It is assumed, finally, that 70%, 75% uh, of fibrolytic microbiota are really attached to the plant cell walls. During the colonization process, a large set of enzymes are produced by the microbiota. Given the diversity of the molecule in plant cell walls and the various chemical bonds, as you can see here, that need to be broken, uh, fibrolytic microbiota must produce numerous and complementary enzymatic activities, 
such as glycoside hydrolysis, or GH, or carbohydrate esterases, or CE. Genomic analysis in cellulolytic bacteria has shown that in one single genome on one bacterial species, we have uh, dozens of genes encoding for carbohydrate active enzymes, which really shows the huge potential for fiber degradation in these microorganisms. A recent study in our team uh, investigated the Roman Macrobiota metatranscriptome, which is a repertoire of truly expressed genes from the microbiota. As mentioned just before, it is very clear that bacteria are very active in fiber degradation, as a lot of carbohydrate active enzymes encoding genes are expressed in the, these cells, as you can see here as the blue bars. But protozoa and fungi must not be forgotten, as you can see that they have a true participation in cellulose and hemicellulose degradation, as seen here with the yellow and brown uh, bars. Uh, and this participation is uh, higher than uh, previously thought uh, before. Among bacteria, uh, there are several uh, most active genera, such as Fibrobacter, Ruminococcus, or Vibrio as the, the most important. These data show us also, as seen by the green bars here, that there is an important proportion of active uh, expressed genes uh, targeting fiber degradation that have not been assigned to any reference microbial genus or species. So there is probably unknown uh, fraction of the rumen microbiota, which is truly cellulolytic or hemicellulolytic. So finally, even 50, uh, 70 years after the discovery of Fibrobacter succinogenes by the professor Marvin Bryant in the US, there is still to discover in this Roman macrobiota uh, system. The activity of uh, fibrolytic macrobiota results in a generation of a trophic chain where each step is important. Actually, it starts by uh, fiber degradation, degradation of plant polymer by these uh, uh, specialized microorganisms, leading to the release of oligosaccharides and soluble sugars, which are in turn reutilized by other species to produce fermentation products, uh, which are thus reused by other species to finally generate end products of fermentation under the form of uh, fermentation gases, methane and CO2, and two VFAs, volatile fatty acids, mainly acetate, butyrate, and propionate, which represent 75% of the energy needs of uh, an animal. So keeping an active fibrolytic microbiota at the start of the process is thus really crucial to ensure a good remain functioning. In its life, a ruminant undergoes huge anatomical, physiological, nutritional, and even psychological challenges. From calving and, uh, and birth, weaning, further growth of the pre-productive states to gestation, parturition, and the production stages, lactation and fattening, uh, we have a lot of challenge. Uh, the animal has to, to face a lot of challenges. And these challenges can be even worsened by heat stress conditions or changes in herd management practice, for example. Since the last decades, a lot of research has been devoted on investigating the impact of all these life cycle steps on rumen function and health. And this research has revealed that during all these periods, the rumen microbiota and the rumen epithelial wall as well can encounter many challenges as their environment is submitted to numerous variations, such as, for instance, changes in rumen pH, in redox potential, or changes in uh, availability of adhesion sites and nutrients. Fibrolytic microbiota is very sensitive to changing conditions in the rumen ecosystem, and this can really impact fiber degradation, of course, and animal efficiency and well-being. I will give you a few examples of these factors that can influence fibrolytic microbiota. First of all, the microbiota can be affected by competition uh, events between uh, species. In the presented example here, using a gnotobiotic sheep model, so when the, where the microbiota can be controlled, 
Uh, three species of bacteria were monitored by quantitative PCR, Fibrobacter succinogenes, Ruminococcus albus, and Ruminococcus flavivations. The lambs were followed during the first period, where the rumen had been transplanted, transplanted with Fibrobacter succinogenes, which established without any problems, as you can see on the green curves. Uh, in the second period, the lambs were inoculated with two species of Ruminococcus, and we see that in period two, uh, we have a displacement of fibrobacter due to competition for adhesion sites on plantel walls with, with the Ruminococcus species that had been inoculated. A consequence of that was a shift in volatile fatty acid profile towards more acetate and butyrate and less propionate, and an increase in phenolic metabolites, which may have antimicrobial properties for some of the species. The second example it shows the evolution of bacterial communities in the rumen of cows that were fed with TMR and pasture. Here, the solid and liquid contents of the rumen were analyzed, and the figure shows the discriminant analysis between groups. One dot represents, in fact, one bacterial profile in one individual. What appears very clearly on this picture is that bacterial profiles were clearly different according to the diet, in particular in the liquid phase. Solid contents were less variable among individuals and also among diets, uh, but uh, still different. Regarding the fibrolytic microbiota, Fibrobacteraceae family was found more abundant in the cows were fed TMR, which was probably due to the presence of straw in the diet, straw being one of the major substrate for this bacterial family. And on the contrary, when the cows were fed pasture, we found a higher abundance of prevotelacea, which uh, indicated a shift of the fermentation profile toward propionate production. Overall, these examples really show that changes in fibrolytic microbiota, composition or activity, can have a strong impact on the rumen fermentation profile. Some other examples here from in vitro studies, which show the high sensi sensitivity of fibrolytic populations to oxygen. Oxygen enters the rumen regularly during feed or water intake and rumination phases, of course. On the first graph here, uh, oxygen stress was applied to two cultures of two cellulolytic bacteria, Fibrobacter succinogenes and Ruminococcus flavifacians. And you can see that very quickly after the stress in exposure, oxygen stress exposure, we had a very strong decrease in the percentage of adherent cells onto cellulose. And this effect was really strain dependent. Fibrobacter was the most sensitive compared to Ruminococcus. The second examples show uh, a variation in the cellulolytic activity of Ruminococcus albus after an oxygen stress as 40% of the activity onto cellulose was decreased uh, after oxygen exposure. The last example here showed an the effect of an oxygen stress applied to diluted rumen fluid and a reduction of NDF degradation was observed after oxygen stress, after 48 hours of incubation. And here the substrates uh, were alpha alpha ray or consilage. So overall, it can be concluded that fibrolytic microbiota is very reactive to oxygen stress, which leads to a reduced adhesion to plant cell walls, reduced activity, and finally, a decreased fiber digestibility. So now, uh, after having exposed all these different factors, how could we propose to improve uh, microbial fiber degradation? I will take today an example of the use of a rumen modifier, namely a rumen specific yeast, live yeast, Levusel SC, for which we have strong evidence of effic efficacy on rumen function, and in particular, uh, through the promotion of fibrolytic microbiota, fiber colonization, and uh, fibrolytic activities. This live yeast strain, named CNCM I1077, exerts different modes of action. Nutrient supply, especially uh, vitamin B uh, at the microhabitat level, and nutritional interactions 
promote growth and persistence of these fibrolytic populations. These live yeast cells are able to scavenge oxygen in rumen contents, which creates more favorable anaerobic conditions for adhesion and fiber colonization process. The live yeast strain is also able to control rumen pH and to stabilize it, which positively influences uh, fibrolytic communities. Overall, benefits are observed only with active cells, live cells of yeast. I will give you uh, a few examples of this efficacy. We have, for example, shown that Levusel SC is able to stimulate fiber colonization by cellulolytic bacteria and fungi. For bacteria here, I show an example on Butyrivibrio fibrisolvans, where we, we, we can see that we have a higher level of colonizing microorganisms onto fiber. Um, in fact, uh, as uh, you know, uh, lignocellulosic material is often colonized by fungi, which exert both a physical and enzymatic action on plant cell walls, I, as uh, I just said before. Promotion of these fungi could enhance their action on particle disruption, which could have a direct impact on reducing the fraction which is poorly accessible for themselves and for bacteria, helping the release of digestible polysaccharides like cellulose or hemicellulosis. This microbial cooperation between fungi and bacteria will finally induce a better digestion. Another example with various in vivo rumen cannulated cow experiments, which have confirmed the benefits of the use of Levisal SC. And you see here on this histogram a summary of the NDFD uh, database we got currently with more than 360 forage samples. Using Levusel SC at a consistent dosage across all the studies, the improvement of fiber digestibility is clearly measured, as you can see, but with differences according to the type of forage. So the physical and the chemical structure of the forage, as well as the microbiota able to colonize and digest this forage, greatly matters. We found that within the same forage type, the extent of increase is related to the fiber digestibility potential. In other words, lower is the digestibility of the forage, higher can be the effect of Lewis LSC. We performed a recent study around parturition in use. Uh, and parturition, as you know, is a very challenging uh, period at both the animal and the rumen level. The use had been supplemented with Levis LSC three to four weeks before parturition. Rumen macrobiota was screened thanks to DNA sequencing technique before supplementation, time zero, and at parturition, time one. Interestingly, we observed in the control group that the fibrolytic population of Fibrobacter S uh, was decreased by 38% at parturition, whereas it was much less. Uh, decrease much more stable in the Levis LSC group uh, with only a, a small decrease of 8%. So the deleterious effect of parturition of fibrolytic macrobiota could be elevated by the distribution of the live yeast strain. This was translated into a more stable VFA uh, content in the supplemented rumens, indicated that the presence of Levis LSC helped to supply more energy after parturition and for the start of lactation. Finally, I would like to give you a few take home messages. First, that the rumen ecosystem is engineered to be centered around the degradation of plant fiber by a complex microbial community, which is highly efficient. Uh, it is highly efficient, but it is very sensitive to its environment. And this may have negative impacts on fiber digestibility, feed conversion, and finally production at the animal level. Using a rumen modifier such as Levis LSC, a rumen specific yeast, helps promote or stabilize these key microbiota. And we have now a lot of expertise on its benefits on various dietary and stress situations. And thanks to the improved fiber digestibility, Ruminants extract more from the fiber part of the diet, which is particularly relevant in today's agricultural systems. 
thanks for your attention and I will take any questions at the end of the session. Frederic, really uh, thank you for your uh, clear information. It's really clear that uh, rumen microbes are uh, uh, important for this fiber digested uh, kinetics. So now I will give the microphone to uh, to Emiliano. Thank you, Emiliano, to join us. Uh, could you help us understanding how this dynamics is translated into a diet formulation software? Okay, thank you, Aurelien, for the um, introduction. So, and thank you to Laleman for the opportunity. Uh, so, I'm assuming that some of you already know well, what the CNCPS is. So, but I, I will just try to um, reintroduce, uh, you know, a few concepts, few important concepts that uh, are really important when we talk about um, NDF. Uh, so. So the CNCPS, which stands for uh, Cornell Net Carbohydrate and Protein System, is basically an evaluation tool, first of all, okay? Before it is used to formulate, you know, it was born mainly to evaluate uh, diets. And it's a combination of empirical and mechanistic uh, equations, algorithms, that try to basically match requirements and supply of the animal. So obviously we uh, would focus on dairy cows, but it is true for other ruminants. Uh, as well. So the requirements part is usually generally um, uh, empirical equations. Uh, you know, the requirements are split based on the different functions, so maintenance, pregnancy, lactation, uh, growth, reserves. Um, and then, having said that, the animal characteristics are extremely important to define uh, those requirements. So again, it's based on the user uh, inputs that requirements are defined. And then, based on the micro environment where the uh, animals uh, are farmed, where they live, adjustments are made for uh, environment and uh, main activity. The supply is usually uh, using mechanistic equations. Uh, then there is a room and some model that, and the intestinal digestibility that they drive the supply. So they define uh, with more details uh, the supply and you know, because again, the user has a huge weight in determining those supply feed characteristics. So what we enter in terms of feed characteristics uh, is extremely uh, important. Then there are, you know, some interactions um, between feeds or, you know, uh, related to management that have uh, an effect on the, uh, on the final supply uh, quantities. But again, I want to emphasize, I want to underline, you know, the animal inputs and the feed inputs as the main driver of the, uh, not only requirements of supply, but also of the use that we make of the, of the CNCPS. And this is true for any type of model evaluating and formulating uh, rations. So yes, the CNCPS has been growing in terms of popularity in the last uh, decade, I would say. So, but it's, you know, it's a great model, sure, but Again, it's heavily dependent on the user input. So whatever quality of the data we input, you know, the same quality will be obtained in terms of uh, uh, model outputs. So again, sure, it is a great model, but it is as great as the data uh, that we use and also how often this data is uh, updated. So just to go uh, briefly in the, into, you know, inside the CNCPS, uh, algorithms. So I will not, obviously, I will not go and talk about equations, but just to uh, emphasize how uh, the feeds, which, you know, today we, we are focusing on fiber and therefore feeds, are uh, managed within the, uh, the CNCPS. So the, the feeds are classified by being forages, concentrates, or liquids, and then within of each class, within of, the, of each of these class, carbohydrates and proteins are then uh, separated, fractionated, we say, uh, into pools. So we talk about carbohydrates pools and protein pools. And then we talk about minerals and fat and fatty acids. Okay. So each of this class has a uh, different rate of passage. So uh, rate of passage are assigned you know, to either forages, concentrates, or liquids. And then each of these fraction within of each class. So if I talk about a specific carbohydrate pool for a specific forage, 
will have a specific KD. So obviously there will be only three rate of passages, so based on the three classes, but there will be you know, many uh, rates of digestions uh, depending on the number of pools for carbohydrates uh, and pools, uh, sorry, for carbohydrates and proteins. So again, let's focus on fiber. What are the characteristics required by the CNCPS in terms of fiber? So obviously we want to quantify uh, this fiber. So we talk about MDF, um, which is intended to be ash-free you know, since 1992, but it wasn't really implemented in commercial labs until a few years ago. So let's be careful you know, of what our lab uh, is giving and let's be careful in what we input in the, uh, in the CNCPS. So we need to have the amylase NDF uh, organic matter, which is again the uh, ash-free NDF. So the difference can have, uh, you know, a, 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 depending on the amount of the ash, you know, can have any, a, a great impact or small impact on different uh, model outputs. So again, most commercial labs nowadays uh, offer both of these uh, two numbers. So uh, again, let's be uh, careful in what we use. So besides the uh, NDF amount, we want to know how much of this NDF is unavailable. Okay, so we talk about indigestible NDF. Nowadays is estimated by UNDF 240. So the residual NDF after 240 hours of uh, in vitro fermentation. Until a few years ago, some of you might remember that the 2.4 factor was used, multiplying the lignin and therefore quantifying the, um, the NDF, the, the indigestible NDF. Uh, nowadays, we uh, have started to use this number also not only to uh, quantify the indigestible NDF, but also as a management tool. Uh, and, you know, plant scientists uh, are also geneticists are also uh, getting interested in, uh, you know, if it is controlled by genetics, uh, if it is affected by environmental uh, conditions. So there are, you know, many uh, interests, many kind of fields that deal with this uh, new, you know, recent uh, number. So if we look at the all fractions or pools of the carbohydrates, you'll see that we have from the A to the, to the C. So A are DFA, lactic acid, organic acid, sugar. Then we have starch, soluble fiber, and then the B3 and the C, which are the ones that I just mentioned. So the potentially digestible NDF and the unavailable um, NDF. So obviously, each of these will have to have a different rate of degradation. Uh, now, just to, uh, to underline that the only one that is calculated in the, in the CNCPS is the soluble fiber, just because we don't have, as today, we don't have a, uh, a good procedure to quantify, to quantify soluble fiber uh, from commercial labs. So uh, if we talk about protein, we also talk about fractions. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to mention something about proteins because sometimes we forget there is, you know, a fraction, the B2 of the protein, which is the true protein linked to the available fiber. Okay, so sometimes we forget about that this uh, uh, quantity here and its quality is also determined by the quality of the uh, potentially uh, degradable NDS. Okay, so obviously. Uh, the C also in this case it's the one that is uh, uh, available. Now each of these fractions, as I mentioned before, uh, will have to have a, a rate of degradation assigned. So uh, again, as I mentioned before, it is fraction and feed specific. So again, each class within each class and within each fraction, uh, we will have to have a KD. Okay? Uh, some of these KDs are assigned by the feed library. But you know the most important ones, like starch, for example, or fiber, uh, is assigned by the user and coming from uh, data uh, resulting from labs uh, analysis. Okay, uh, again, uh, this is an extremely important value that uh, will affect the model output. So just to give you an idea of the numbers that we have in terms of. Uh, uh, rate of degradation. So these are all the fractions that we find uh, in the CNCPS, or at least the latest version of the CNCPS. And again, the B3 and C are the ones uh, that we've been talking about. So the uh, 
uh, PD and the F goes between 2 and 15 on average, but obviously we can find you know, extreme values that might go under 2 or uh, slightly above 15. And then obviously the C fraction has a KD equal to 0 because it is uh, indigestible. For the passage rate, uh, again, we don't talk only about fiber. Well, we, here we talk about the classes that I mentioned before. So forages, concentrates, and liquid phase. Okay, so these numbers uh, will be heavily affected again also on the uh, inputs. So, and what inputs I mean, uh, body weight, uh, forage content, and dry matter intake. So, if you are a nutritionist, you know that uh, having this number dry matter intake, uh, or at least an estimation of it, uh, is important for many reasons. So, now we know that uh, dry matter intake affects also rate of passage. So again, this is an extra reason why we should uh, measure intake of our cows. Uh, and again, and then there is an adjustment for uh, NDF intake in terms of uh, uh, body weight. So each fraction of a class of feed so is assumed to pass at the same uh, rate. So I mentioned before, chemical characteristics required for fiber are obviously ANDF or N, and uh, UNDF 240. But obviously, we need to assign a KD to this uh, B3 fraction, so the potentially digestible uh, NDF. So our lab usually uh, gives us three time points, so 30, 120, and 240 hours for forages, 12, 72, and 120 for non-forage uh, products. So these three numbers uh, uh, allow you to calculate a rate of degradation for fibers. Now, recently we also have suggested to add a 12 hour time point, especially for higher quality uh, forages. So, just to give you uh, an example, so if I have, for example, these three time points 30, 120, and 240, they will result on a KD of 4.5% uh, per hour. So these are numbers that usually we obtain from uh, the commercial labs. And then um, the, the CNCPS-based platforms, like, uh, like NDS, for example, will be having tool calculating the rate uh, for you. This is the specific example of NDS uh, professional, where we input, in this case, we have a current silage. We input those three numbers plus the 12 hours uh, time point will result in a KD of 4.44, okay? Um, nowadays, the, the, the rate calculator uh, will also provide what we define as fast and slow degrading uh, NDF pool, okay? Both in terms of amount, so in this case, 44% for fast, 35 of the slow, and the respective KD. So the KD for the fast and, and the KD for the slow. So these are not, uh, yet used in the CNCPS 6.55, which is the latest version of CNCPS, but they are supposed to be used in the near future for the next version uh, of the CNCPS. Uh, so I just wanted to show you this specific current silage because this is the one uh, that we will use in our uh, example later. So we have this current silage A, and remember, try to remember this number, these numbers, and then we have the current silage uh, B which has slightly higher uh, NDF digestibility, and that will determine an increase of the KD at 6.20 uh, respect compared to the corn silage B, and it will also shift, uh, increase some of the fast pool. So if you, if you remember the KD uh, for the fast pool and the slow pool, you know, have not changed much, but what has changed is the, the size of the, of the fast pool. So these are the two current silages that we'll use in, the, in our NDS example. Now, obviously, some of you might ask, uh, but I mean, really, why should we talk about, make things more complicated and talk about fast pool and a slow pool? So if you remember something about your plant anatomy, um, actually, the cell wall of the plants is made of a primary wall and a secondary cell wall. So the primary wall is the one that is older in terms of age, and the secondary wall is the is a younger one. So the first one, the primary, is the one that is more lignified uh, compared to the secondary wall. And in fact, we also have proof, you know, from the from microbial biology 
that the box actually ferment the cell from the inside out, which is the, uh, the easier for them because it's, a, it's again uh, what we have defined as fast pool compared to the primary wall, which would contain more slow pool and indigestible MBF. So obviously, the distribution of these two pools, uh, actually three pools, as you say, uh, in families of plants will change, will be heterogeneous, but you know it will be less distinct in a grass uh, when, as compared to a, a legume. Then we know these two parts are more uh, distinct. Now let's go back to what we were looking at, the CMTPS uh, model flow. So we have talked about the uh, feed fractions, and obviously those fractions, once they enter uh, the rumen, again, they will be fermented uh, according to the KD, they will stay in the rumen according to their KP. Uh, but interestingly, you know, the, the, uh, obviously uh, it's impossible to go, you know, uh, in, in the complexity that the previous presentation was showing, but at least there is, you know, a separation between fiber digesting microbes that grow slowly and they use mainly uh, ammonia nitrogen as a main source of nitrogen. Uh, as compared to the NFC uh, bugs, uh, which will ferment, you know, everything else, uh, all the other carbohydrates, and they will grow more fast. Uh, so they, again, they won't use only ammonia nitrogen, but they will use also uh, true protein. Uh, even for the maintenance requirements uh, for these bugs, things are different. So uh, the grams of bugs for grams of carbohydrates per hour will be different. So uh, the fiber uh, bugs will grow a little bit slowly. Uh, when compared to the NFC uh, bugs. So things obviously uh, can get more complicated. So this is was only the rumor sub model, but when we go out of the rumor sub model uh, and we continue in our um, you know, intestinal tract, uh, you know that everything is then uh, digested in the abomasum and then obviously uh, metabolizable energy and metabolizable protein is derived by this digestion. And then uh, all the functions need to be satisfied, as I uh, mentioned before. So let's go to some numbers. Let's see uh, what the effects you know, might be of using different uh, forages. So this is a case study of, uh, of group cows. Uh, and again, remember, we always talk about average numbers of a group of cows. Uh, in this case, they uh, produce about 42 uh, so we're talking here about you know 90 pounds of, of milk for those of the, from the US. Um, we have 100 days of milk, 385 of fat, 336 of protein, and so on. So uh, in this case, uh, this is a this is a group of cows weighing 700 uh, kg, so about 1500 uh, pounds um, at much true body weight, uh, 800 kg. So what are you know uh, what are we doing here? So we are feeding this cow sprout now with the corn silage A. So remember that it was the less degradable one, the one with the uh, smaller, uh, lower KD. So feeding exactly uh, about 10.5 uh, kg trimeter of corn silage. And obviously we do have other, a uh, couple of other forages, uh, corn grain, canola meal, soybean meal, and a mix containing minerals, vitamins, and other, uh, other feeds. Uh, so trimeter intake of 26.4 kg, forage of 57%, which is already uh, a good amount of forage. So requirements in terms of energy and protein are satisfied. And, you know, in this case, obviously, each of you will have different prices for feeds and different price for milk, but this is just to give you uh, an idea of what happens when we uh, change forages. Uh, so 1281 in terms of cost in euros, uh, and income or feed cost will be, uh, in this case, 11 euros, 0.20 cents. So let's assume that we swap to uh, forages. So corn silage A is swapped with corn silage B, again, the one with higher KD. So as expected, you know, now the, uh, the rumen has more and the effort can be uh, fermented, and that results in both more energy and more protein uh, available. So higher metabolizable energy and higher metabolizable protein. So at this stage, we're assuming that these cows are consuming exactly the same amount of trimeter, so 26.4 kg also in this case, okay? 
But what happens here that there is no change in terms of cost, there is no change in terms of uh, income or feed cost. Because again, I assume that these cows are still producing uh, the same. So, you know, as a nutritionist, I have different options now because I'm feeding uh, a higher quality corn silage. So just to uh, go over some of the nutrients, so uh, the corn silage be at a slightly higher uh, NBF, so I have a, a, about 1% point uh, of increase NBF. Uh, again, that increase, that resulted in increased PE uh, NBF, uh, in an increase uh, potentially digestible NBF, uh, and also a very small uh, increase of U uh, NBF. A starch that was a small, also 1.5% uh, decrease or so. And crude protein uh, was basically uh, almost uh, the same. So again, I was mentioned before that I have a few options. So I'm a, a fan of forages, I'm a fan of fiber. So uh, my uh, first option would be to increase forages because obviously I'm feeding higher quality one. So uh, my energy and protein available are higher than 100%. So what I do is increase the forages percent in the same diet, uh, decreasing or at least uh, calibrating again my model so I could feed up to the 100% of the requirements in terms of energy and protein, uh, so which was uh, again driven by the input that we put in the in the model. So again, 42.5 kg uh, was the original production. So what happens in this case that I have a, uh, a slightly uh, decrease of the cost, the price obviously was the same, that resulted in an increase of about 50 cents of the income over feed cost. So the only change of the two forages, the only um, uh, increase of the forages percent made me actually make uh, uh, more money, at least 50 cents uh, per cow. Now, just to uh, look at some of the uh, uh, inputs, actually some of the model outputs. So now I'm comparing the original ration, so the first one that I showed you with the first corn silage, okay? And then the second one, or I should say the third uh, ration with corn silage B, but with more forages. So the main results you see that now have more, uh, you know, energy and protein available in the rumen uh, that translated into more microbial protein. So I went from 54% of, uh, of the MP uh, to 56%. Uh, percent. Rumen ammonia slightly decreased, but again, I'm on the uh, you know, range of the, of the guidelines of the range. Um, NDF the fermented uh, increase, so from 3.8 kg to 4.2 uh, kg uh, per day. Now, the take home messages from this basically is that NDF quality digestibility, so whatever is digested from NDF, is an important determinant of uh, metabolizable energy, metabolizable protein, allowable milk. So again, I'm a, I'm a great you know, fan of forages and fiber. So if I can get more from the fiber into the rumen, that will allow me to make more milk. Higher NDF digestibility results in various options. Okay, so the first, the change, the example that I gave you here was that I assumed that the intake was stable. Okay, um, and then we would increase the forage to concentrate, concentrate ratio. Okay, then in that case, higher NDF digestibility would then result in higher uh, income or feed costs and therefore profit, which is what we are looking at. Uh, however, things you know uh, are not always as simple as I showed because uh, uh, when we have uh, NDF as the main limiting factor, and that usually is true for higher yielding animals, an increase of digestibility would also re result in increased intake and yield. Okay. So obviously, again, that was an option uh, that I gave you, but in the field, things might change because uh, if intake increases, then obviously I can expect uh, uh, an increase uh, in yield uh, as well. And then, you know, uh, whatever I input into the CNCPS will need to be adjusted. And again, that goes back to measuring intake and measuring uh, all the uh, necessary inputs that the CNCPS uh, requires. So again, higher digestibility in this case means uh, more profit, 
and uh, I thank you. And I um, I left my email address in case you have more questions, uh, but I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have now. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Emiliano. Thank you, Frederic, for your presentation. Um, L'Allemand is really uh, committed to bring uh, fundamental research to, to the field. And, uh, and this webinar is exactly a, a good example of it. L'Allemand is bringing services and also solutions to address animal challenge. And uh, as, you, uh, as you can see, uh, today significant progress has been made to, uh, in model uh, refinement over the past years through uh, the inclusion of uh, more biological and dynamic pathways for uh, ruminant digestion. And these uh, non-linear refined uh, models provide a, a good path for innovative uh, formulation systems. And this for sure offers uh, opportunities to, to fine tune the, really the prediction of the nutrition value of, of the diet. And this including, for example, potential submodels with uh, with rumen modified. 